Hi, my name is Jen Davis. I'm a lecturer and a researcher in the physiotherapy group at the School of Healthcare Sciences at Cardiff University. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the research that I do. What I'm really interested in is understanding how muscle activity is controlled during movements. So in today's session, we'll talk about how the neural control of coordinated muscle activity is complex. And despite that, there are some methods that we can use to prove the neural control of muscle activity during movement. And I'll talk about what some of these look like. And then we'll start to think about where this might be useful. So as we're going through today's session, if there are particular things or concepts that you find interesting or that you might want to learn more about, it might be a good idea to jot these down as we go through so you can come back to them again at the end. The first thing that's important to understand is that muscle activity can be measured. Now you're probably already familiar with this from ECG. So when muscle contracts, it generates an electrical signal. We can measure that if we stick sensors on the skin that's on top of that muscle, we can measure the electrical signal and study it. And that's what ECG is, sensors on, on top <coughs> measuring the muscle activity generated by the heart. It's the same thing for skeletal muscle. So you can put sensors on top of a muscle and measure the activity of that muscle. So here's a video of me doing that for the supraspinatus, which is a muscle on the back of the shoulder, and the infraspinatus. And you can see um, this sensor on both of those muscles. And when this person pushes out against my hand here, you can see at the same time we start to pick up an electrical signal. That's the activity of the muscle. And then when she relaxes, that signal goes away. So you can start to see where those muscles are active. So you can see how she raises her arm. There's a small amount of muscle activity in each muscle. And then when she relaxes, that goes away. This is really important for physiotherapists to understand because we need to know how much muscles are active in different movements and when it's safe to prescribe them to people um, to do as part of their rehabilitation. The second thing to understand is that activity of many, many muscles can be coordinated in complex patterns. And a really good example of this is something we do every day that involves tens and tens and tens of muscles that are, that are coordinated in a very precise manner. And we don't even think about it. And that's walking. So what we've done when we're walking, we can stick electrodes on top of some of the muscles and record what those muscles are doing. So this is the activity of this muscle here, I am called the tibialis anterior on the front of your shin. And you, this on the X axis, this is where you put your heel down in stride. And then you're walking through the stride, this is where you pick your foot up again, start to swing through the air, and this is where you put it down again to start the next stride. So you can see that this muscle is active at particular points of the gait cycle of the stride and quiet at others. And if we look at a different muscle, so this one is from a calf muscle, um, it's active at different parts of the stride. This is a hamstring muscle, the same thing, and this is a quadricep muscle. And this is just four of the muscles, but there are many, many more that we could um, study. But what's apparent is that the coordination between these muscles, they turn on and they turn off at different times of the stride cycle. And that timing and that coordination is critical to allow us to walk without falling over. But where does that coordination come from? Where is it controlled? And this is what I'm really interested in understanding. So one of the things you might think of, it's the brain. The brain sends signals down to the muscles, and that's certainly true to some degree. The signals that the brain sends down um, go down the spinal cord and then go out to the muscles to make muscle contraction. The spinal cord is much more interesting than that. So if we take a section here, imagine what the spinal cord looks like. It's not just those signals coming from the brain that are in the spinal cord. There's sensory neurons. Um, these ones shown on this diagram are from muscles, but they're also ones from, um, from joints, from skin, all, all kinds of things that feed into the spinal cord. And then in that spinal cord, there's a whole network of neurons. You can imagine it like spaghetti junction, like a road. You know, the information goes different ways and it gets processed differently before it comes back to these neurons that then affect the muscle activity. So it's not just the brain that's controlling our muscle activity. There's a lot of control that goes on at the spinal cord as well. So there are multiple levels of control, spinal and supraspinal. Supraspinal means from the brain, essentially. So how do we start to study these and unpick exactly what's going on in different, in different movements and in different conditions? Let's start with the spinal. If we think of this diagram that we had before, 
Um, what we're trying to study is the information that's going around some of these circuits. So these, the, the nerves that are coming from the, the muscles in the legs, you know, that look something like this, you know, they're traveling, traveling through the body and then it's going back up into the spinal cord. So what I do in my work is I will stick some electrodes on top of those nerves. So on top of the skin, that's on top of the nerve. So this here in this diagram will be stimulating this nerve right about here. Now what happens then is I deliver a really small electric pulse to those electrodes and it stimulates the nerve. So what it does is it will send information along this pathway into the spinal cord. And what we can do is measure how the muscle responds to that information and that tells us how that information is being used by the nervous system at that particular point in the movement. So what I do is I study this while people are walking. So I get people to walk on a treadmill and I stimulate this nerve at very specific parts of the gait cycle. Now what happens is we see a response in the muscle. So this is an activity of the quadricep muscle, which is on the front of the thigh. In this very thin gray line that you can see here, that's its activity in a normal stride. Now in this black line here, I've given a stimulation to the nerve. Now a few more, well, about 30 or 40 milliseconds after, you can see there's a reflex response in the quadricep muscle. So what that's meaning is the nervous system is taking information from that nerve and depending on on that information, it's using it to control the, the timing of the quadriceps muscle, of activity in the quadriceps muscle. So we can know some things um, about that pathway that we're studying. So it's a, the nerve goes from ankle dorsiflexus, so it goes from muscles on the front of your shin to muscles on the front of your thigh. And the particular sensory afferents that we're studying in this design um, are from the muscles or the tendons. The amount of time it takes to get from the stimulus to the response tells you about how many of these little networks um, the information has gone through. And you can see two peaks here and we can manipulate those two peaks differently, which means they're telling us about two different pathways. And then we can look at those, the, that reflex in different situations to see when the nervous system thinks the information in this pathway is important. So for example, when you're just standing still, you don't see this second peak here. So what the nervous system has the capacity to do is information that's flowing along some of these sensory pathways. If it's not interested, if that's not gonna be helpful to the movement, it almost, you can imagine gates closing, it shuts off. It's not interested in that information anymore. And that's really interesting is to look at in what circumstances is the nervous system interested in information along certain pathways and in what case isn't it? And in some conditions or, um, or some circumstances where movement and muscle activity has changed, perhaps that's because some of these gates are opening and closing at the wrong time and information is getting through in places where it wouldn't normally be considered by the nervous system. So we've got some current best guesses about which pathways this information is going through. And as I said, by stimulating these in different situations, it starts to help us understand which pathways might be going wrong in some kind of, in some clinical conditions. So we've just come now to think about supraspinal control. So how could we really start to look at whether the brain's contributing to different muscle activities during movements? There's one technique I use called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the principles are very similar to, to what we just talked about for, for peripheral nerves. And if we stimulate that pathway, send information along it and look how the muscles respond, we can start to understand how the information in that pathway is being used by the nervous system. And this is a technique that we use to stimulate the cortical neurons, so stimulate a, a part of the brain that sends the signals down to the muscles. So in this coil here that I'm holding over this participant's head, you can discharge a large magnetic field or a large capacitance through some wires in the coil. It generates in a magnetic field which can pass through the scalp painlessly and then induce a current in the neurons underneath it. So what we do then, what that current does, is it'll activate those neurons, they'll send the signal down to the muscle. And so here, this is the time I give the stimulation, and then about 23 milliseconds later, this is one of the lower limb muscles, um, quadriceps again on the front of the thigh, you see a response in that muscle. So this tells you how long does it take information to get down from my brain to my muscle. And in most people, for these, it depends how far away the muscle is from the brain, but for this muscle, it's about 23 milliseconds. 
And that information on its own is quite useful to physiotherapists. Some conditions involve um, information going slower along nerves, and we can measure that with this kind of technique. Um, one of the studies that I did with this technique recently was to stimulate on a lot of different places. So deliver this um, stimulation a lot of different places over the scalp, so a lot of different places to the motor cortex, and looked at the size of the responses. <clears throat> so trying to unpick, is there a particular place in the cortex that's got most of the neurons that communicate to the leg muscles? So traditionally, um, the, the cortex was thought to be divided quite discreetly in that um, neurons that controlled facial muscles and hands are located laterally. And then as you come to the middle um, and down into the fold in the middle, um, that's where the neurons are that control the leg muscles. So one of the important questions here is, if these neurons are really down in this fold, can we even stimulate them? And can we activate that part of the brain that controls the muscles in the leg? So the answer to that is yes. So these are the size of the responses that I see at stimulation at each of these points on the, on the cortex. And what we can do is make them into a kind of heat map. So this big red bit here is this large response here. And that's where we see the biggest response. So I did this for lots of muscles in the lower limb and made lots of different heat maps um, in 18 young, healthy adults from seven lower limb muscles. And I'm looking at the size um, and how, how the muscles are represented in the cortex. And the conclusion really is, well, first of all, that we can stimulate these muscles, which is great, um, but also that the topography, the way they're represented is complex and there's multiple peaks. So there's probably multiple places in the cortex that can be stimulated and send signals down to those muscles. There isn't one place that activates the quadriceps and one place that activates the hamstrings. Um, and so what this paper, provides is what that looks like in healthy people. So then what we can do in the future, we could start to look at, you know, has that changed in people that have got a, a pathology or a clinical population? So this is published <clears throat> in a journal, which um, other scientists can read and use that information as they start to study clinical populations. So just as we come to the end here, I'm just gonna talk about where I'm taking this next. As I was saying at the start, I'm really interested in how muscle activity is controlled while we're moving. It's really difficult to do this brain stimulation while people are moving because you have to have the, the stimulator in a very specific location um, on the top of the head. So what I've spent the last few years doing is working with a company, working with industry to develop a system that will let us keep the coil in the same place on the head while someone's walking on a treadmill. That's what you can see here. So we've just validated the system. This is how much error there is in where the coil is supposed to be and where it is. And we need to keep this less than three millimeters. And this is across different participants, how well it stayed in that position. And for the majority, it was under three millimeters for the majority of the time. So we've got a system that works now, which is great. So now what I'm doing is I'm moving this system into the big motion capture labs that we've got in the School of Healthcare Sciences, where there's a treadmill in the ground that can wobble and it can move in different directions. Um, and it's got a virtual environment so you can feel like you're walking through a forest or through an airport um, without, without even leaving the lab. And it's got cameras around the top, the same ones that they use in CGI, um, but we can really accurately measure how someone's moving. So we're going to put all this together to start to understand in different situations um, and with different conditions when you're walking, how much is the, the brain having to work to contribute to the muscle activity. This is the recordings of um, some muscle activity when we give a stimulus we can see changes in the muscle activity in the same way that was uh, described for the peripheral nerve stimulation. So in summary, today we've talked about muscle, the fact that muscle activity can be measured and that in itself can be very useful and um, particularly to clinicians, to physiotherapists um, as they're thinking about what movements to, to get people to do. The activity of many, many muscles can be coordinated in complex patterns. And this coordination is controlled at multiple levels of the nervous system. So there are um, spinal and supraspinal. We can probe that neural control while people are moving. And this is what I do in my research. So we can probe spinal pathways using peripheral nerve stimulation. We talked about one example of that. And we can probe corticospinal pathways using a different kind of stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation. 
and I'm going to be doing that during movement now, which is really the first time that this is being developed um, for this purpose. That's really exciting. So the last thing remains for me to say goodbye. I hope you've enjoyed the talk today. Um, please do discuss it with your teachers or your parents. Um, try and find out more about the discipline, either neural control of movement research, physiotherapy, um, anything about that. You can find my information on the website, um, also on Twitter. Um, so you're welcome to, to follow me to find out how this research progresses or contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Hello, this is just a quick presentation about the physiotherapy course at Cardiff University. So my name is Nia James and I'm originally from Carmarthen back in West Wales where I attended a school going Gymraeg for me then, where I did my A-levels, biology, chemistry, maths and the Welsh Baccalaureate. So a few years back now, I was sitting exactly where you all are at the Rhydda Sera Network. Um, my word advice for you today is to, to ask questions. No question is too small or too silly. This is just your chance to gain knowledge and insight into what university life is and experimenting on what type of courses that you may be interested in ready for when you start applying. The physiotherapy course wasn't part of the Rydwath Serum when I was in school, but definitely if this was at the conference, it would have probably steered me more towards even more being a physiotherapist than what I was even back in year 12. Um, so Rydwath Serum definitely did help me trying to narrow down that I wanted to go into a health based course and something science-based. Um, so I wanted to be a physio because at a younger age I was running a lot going to Kamal and Harriers and I sustained quite a bad injury to my knee so as a result I did have a lot of sports physio so I saw more of the sporting aspect but I also back towards the end of school my grandmother had a fall and I saw more of the healthcare and hospital based physiotherapy where they helped her regain her independence and to improve on her walking again post fall. So I saw how much of a rewarding job physiotherapy can be, and that's why I wanted to do it really. So, Cardiff University, I can't recommend it enough. So for someone that is from more of a countryside farming background back in West Wales, it is a bit of a jump from being constantly in the countryside to being in the city but it's so welcoming, everybody's so nice. You've got lovely parks and everything to walk around. It's quite close to the city centre where we are located here. And there's just plenty to do here really. So a lot of people, I had this a lot when I was in school, tend to say that the jump from school to A-levels is a big one and that you need to be prepared for it. But in all honesty, from my experience, it was just the same amount of jump as between GCSEs to A-level. But it's more towards about a change in how they deliver the information to you, basically. So university is mainly more of an independent kind of research, but this doesn't mean that you're left on your own to do the whole course by all means. But it's just you've got to self-manage your time a bit more with your self-studies and turning up to lectures and everything like that. So university courses are basically a combination of between lectures, tutorials and then practical sessions, which we have here specifically with physiotherapy. As physiotherapy is quite a hands-on course, a lot of the weighing is towards practical sessions. So a typical day where we'd have in first year would be learning your anatomy was the more core focus. So you have that knowledge behind you from the very beginning, which is helpful. Um, so you tend to have a lecture in the morning, learning a specific part of the anatomy or physiology. And then you'd go on to have a practical session, usually in the afternoon. So this is where you'd working groups um, so you can visualize stuff on each other shown in the photos there and um, practice your skills this is basically the time for you to make errors and ask for advice and feedback from the lecturers basically and really it's all about problem solving in groups and just helping each other out which i found quite um beneficial as well it's the best way to kind of learn especially with it being a hands-on course it's so really just getting stuck in in the practical sessions so then the second year then it's more of a split so the first semester up until Christmas time it is learning more about your assessment and treatment skills so you put in what you learned in first year more into a clinical kind of scenario so ready for when you go on placement so this is more about the assessment and treatment skills and I was guilty of this before starting university I genuinely thought that 
Um, physiotherapy was more of a sporting and an MSK based course, but I couldn't have been more wrong really. There's so many different aspects to it. Um, you've got something like neurological, you've got respiratory, community, trauma and orthopedics, but specifically to second year, the first part of it is split into your three cores mainly. So that is neurological, musculoskeletal and respiratory. So again, you'd be working in practical sessions within your groups, trying to work out those assessments and treatment skills. We also do have at the Heath campus where we do our lectures at TWS Ant is a simulation suite. And this was quite cool, if I say. Um, it, was ex it was such a good experience to have before starting on placement. So you were put into a simulation suite that was mimicking what it would be like on the ward. So you won't have a big shock when you first enter a hospital as a physiotherapist for your placements just after Christmas, which I found really helpful. And I'm not, and I'm pretty particular that not many universities give you this opportunity. Um, and the biggest part of coming into second year as well is you move out from halls and you come into Cate's. So Cate's is a the student area in Cardiff, and um, you basically live in a house with all your mates, which I can't complain about. So I'm living with five other medic students, two of us are physios, and then we've got one law student. We're all Welsh speakers. We're all coming from across Wales. Met the best people ever. I can't complain at all. Made friends for life, and um, a big aspect of second year. It's, equally in first year is the societies. So I'm a part of the GUM GUM, which is the Welsh Society for Cardiff University, as I'm a Welsh speaker. Um, so we have a lot of socials throughout the year just to get to know everybody and meet new friends. We've had the chance to go up to Scotland or out to Ireland to watch the rugby's, which was an insane experience on a weekend away. And we also have some Christmas balls and summer balls as well. Specifically to the physio course, we do have um, a PAC Society, so it stands for Physiotherapy at Cardiff University. Um, so we had multiple socials, we've just had a social actually a few weeks back. Me being in third year, I'm now classed as a grandparent, and um, so I basically have a physiotherapy child in second year, and I have a physiotherapy grandchild in first year, so they're basically my kids and I look after them if we have socials and everything like that. Um, so a big ad advantage of this society for physio is for someone that's in first year, you can use your parents from second and third year to guide you. So as well as having your lecturers to help you with anything, you can also turn to your physio parents for any advice, because obviously we've been through already what it is in first year, so you can just ask us anything basically. We might be in third year, but we are very approachable. Um, you can also, you've got personal tutors as well to help you in university. So as I'm a Welsh speaker, my first language is Welsh. I specifically asked if I could get a Welsh speaking personal data just because it's easier really. So that's something you can ask for as well. You can turn to them for any advice. They're always there and they're always happy to help. Uh, one exciting experience I've had as well was um, I'm doing a sports martial course diploma on the side of the physiotherapy course. And going over the summer, we had the chance to go to London. Me and one of the other girls in the Middle photo there. We went to London to massage a few of the runners after the sports, um, the London Marathon, and we even got to massage a few Olympic gold medalists as well along the way. So that's a pretty cool experience that I'll remember for a lifetime. And then going on then to the second part of the second year, then this is more placement based, and this is where the fun really starts. On that, you really do realize how much you have learned over the last year and a half. By far the best part of the course. So I've been through some lovely places over the last five placements I've done. I've just finished my fifth one two weeks ago now. I was up in uh, Tonopandi doing med rehab, so I was looking after mainly elderly patients, getting their independence back and really seeing how rewarding that job is, especially for that population. Thoroughly enjoying my time up there. Um, Backtracking slightly then to my first placement, this was in Swansea and this was community based. So I was driving around Swansea, visiting patients in their homes with my clinical educator. Um, and I remember one time we even had fish and chips on the beach in on the Mumbles, seeing those lovely views as I was driving around. That was a really good placement as well. It is worth noting um, with Cardiff University, you can go on the NHS bursary scheme. So it basically, the NHS pays for your course if you want to and 
the university can sort out your accommodation and everything like that for placement so that's one less worry to think about and as well you can get your travel expenses reimbursed um so all costs are paid for basically when you're doing replacements because you can be located anywhere across wales basically and your placements are four weeks long and there's seven of them across the three years so my two best placements by far were down in with bush and pembrokeshire so for someone that comes from West Wales originally, anyway, this was a second night shift to me. Um, we were there during May and June, so it was the summer months, and there's a lot of nice beaches and everything down there. So the first placement down in Withybush, I was doing respiratory, so I was on um, intensive care unit, helping out with kind of respiratory chest physio, more of that. And then uh, my second one at Withybush then was trauma orthopedics. So a lot of people falling and fracturing their hips or something and then just regaining that walking back to them. This was the best two months of the entire course so far. So the, for the first month I was down there, I was living with three lovely girls from the course. And then I was living with another three lovely girls as well then for the second month. And we had some pretty nice Airbnbs we stayed in. The first one had a man's cave. We had a pool table, a starts board, and we even had a little mini bar in it as well. That was lovely. And then for the second month, it was in this massive, I've never seen anything like it, in this massive bungalow, and we had a hot tub. And yes, every evening after placement, we were straight into that hot tub to relax and just have a good time. It is, you learn a lot during the day, but it's definitely more about that work-life balance where you work your half eight till half four and then, try and relax as much as you can then in the evenings. We went a lot for the beaches, as you can see from the photos, um, went for a lot of spins for someone that comes from West Wales and all the other girls comes from England or elsewhere. I felt a bit like a tour guide just showing them the, my hometowns around basically and I had the best two months of my life down there. And then my other placement as well then I've had is musculoskeletal and this was up in Ebervale. So musculoskeletal is something I am very passionate about and I want to specialise in in the future so I thoroughly enjoyed that placement as well and I was living with two lovely people as well. I've made some amazing friends on this course and I can't fault them at all. And another big aspect then of third year is your dissertation. A lot of people say the dreaded dissertation. It is a lot of work but you get a supervisor to help you through it and we tend to work in groups so everybody's there to help each other out basically. So mine is on the anti-gravity treadmill never seen anything like it it's the best piece of kit that i've seen running on it feels like you're running on clouds it is insane it's hard to describe but i'm just going into talking about how is that being used in trying to re re rehabilitate patients or athletes because a lot of those high trained athletes who tend to use the anti-gravity treadmill so it's a very interesting piece of kit to try and use as well so after rambling on there for a bit i can't false Cardiff University one bit and the physiotherapy course is just one of a kind definitely something hands-on based if that's something that you'd like to go into but if you have any questions then please don't hesitate to ask thank you very much